Hi, this is Rahman Sheikh. Welcome to Fortnightly Railway Transportation Systems Podcast. I am the host and railway systems specialist working in this industry for 24 years and counting. This podcast is primarily focused on railway experts who have vast amount of experience and contributed greatly to this amazing industry. This is not a technical seminar, but focuses on feel-good stories, individual journeys, their success and failures, motivating younger generation to kickstart their career in railways and creating a sense of pride for the railway people who devoted their lives on the most environment-friendly public transportation. Today, we joined by an exceptional guest, Stefani Klicka, a chartered engineer with the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and an accomplished professional with a first class Masters of Engineering Honours in Aerospace Materials Science from Imperial College London. Stefani brings over 15 years of experience in the digital transformation of asset management, so casting her expertise in building and directing business strategies, currently working at PA Technology. She is building a business area that develops and owns specialist products for transport. Throughout her illustrious career, Stefani has held key leadership positions including Head of Digital Services at Porterbroke Rail Leasing in Derby, the United Kingdom. Stefani is at the forefront of the shaping and delivering digital strategies for rolling stock and infrastructure. Head of Engineering at MRX Technologies, a Siemens Mobility business. Notably, she played a pivotal role in the development of innovative products and technologies, earning her a place as a named inventor on a worldwide patent for remote condition monitoring technology. Join us as we delve into Stefani's journey, exploring her experiences in digital transformation, technical leadership and her contributions to the rail industry. Get ready for an insightful conversation with Stefani Klecker, a trailblazer in the world of digital services and engineering. Hi, Stefani. Welcome to the pod. Hi, I'm excited to be here. So let's start with my generic first question. Can you share some insights into your journey from studying aerospace material science at Imperial College London to becoming a chartered engineer with Institution of Mechanical Engineering and leading digital transformation in asset management. Yes, I'd love to. So I guess, I mean, if I start right at the beginning, back at Imperial, I absolutely loved my time there, surrounded by brilliant, curious minds and developing technology to really test and push the boundaries of science. When I was at Imperial, an area of specialism for me was failure modes and fraction mechanics. And I really think that's probably what set my career trajectory towards the use of digital and technology and asset management. So at uni, what we looked at is the fact that physical things have life cycles. They experience real world conditions and environment. Um, They wear out. They change, they deform, they ultimately break. You know, I was really excited by that field. And ultimately what that means is it means disruption to the people who are actually relying on those things. Um, So the understanding and awareness that I got at Imperial really led me to be really passionate about how do you deploy and develop technology to start looking into that, you know, monitoring what's happening and responding to that asset or thing in a way that actually minimizes the impact that that has on the people who are reliant on it. Um, So I guess from that position, really, my onward career exposed me to kind of how do you actually go about realising that in the real world? So from Imperial, I actually started my career at um, Rolls-Royce. So they had sponsored my master's and failure mode and fracture mechanics was something I looked at with them on on family. Um, So a natural progression was into the aerospace industry. When I was at Rolls, one of the things that was really interesting was their concept of power by the hour. So I don't know if a lot of your listeners will, will know that concept. But in aviation, um, with engines, instead of owning an engine, you lease an engine. So Rolls-Royce, as the manufacturer of that engineering, completely transformed their business model from one where you manufacture something to just sell it to actually owning that asset for its full life cycle. So what that meant is they only get paid when that engine is working. So proactive monitoring became a fundamental part of Rolls-Royce's business model because they needed to know every second of the day if their engines were functioning. And if they weren't, they needed to do something about it really quickly to get them back on track. So when I was at Rolls, one of the things we saw there was this proactive remote condition monitoring that was in place on these engines, enabling Rolls-Royce to keep track 
of the health of their assets when they were in the air. So at times, you could know that there was an issue with an engine before it had even landed at its destination airport, and you would have a team mobilized ready to fix it as soon as it landed. You know, and that was so exciting. It was cutting edge at that point. But really, I think that kind of formed that, that position in my mind, which was this is something that's really game changing for asset management and something that we could look to deploy, you know, across all transport sectors. From roles, I then moved into the rail space. And I, I assume your listeners are probably more interested in, in, in the rail aspect of asset management. Um, but there was this wonderful kind of shift. So I, I moved from this very large organization of Rolls-Royce in the UK to this tiny organization in Western Australia in Perth. Um, and I lived in Perth for over five years. And I was working for this company, again, surrounded by you know, PhD students, brilliant people developing technology, looking at mining railway health. So we were working with the likes of Rio Tinto, BHP, trying to ensure that their railway tracks were healthy. So it was a tiny organization. And I guess amongst all of us, we were all working on different specialisms. But my particular area was looking at cracking in rails. So it doesn't sound very glamorous, but um, based on my fractional mechanics background, it was actually a, a really natural kind of step for me. Um, so I spent a couple of years in a tin shed, basically testing and developing sensors and, and kind of algorithms that would enable a piece of kit to be pushed along a track to work out how deep are these cracks? How how severe are they? And just to set some context, um, on a mining railway, those cracks can shear the entire track. So it will cause a derailment because the track breaks in half. So understanding how severe those cracks are and when they're likely to fail is really critical. Um, and also in the case of mining railways, usually there's only one track going from the mine to the port. That track breaks, you've got complete halt in your production line, which is hugely expensive. It was such a brilliant experience because, uh, you know, the mining world is unlike, you know, anything that I'd ever seen. Um, the technology and the money that was there to actually invest in innovation w was just so inspiring. So I was in Perth, for, as I say, for about five years. By the end of it, we had proven that this technology had worked and we'd actually got to the point where we developed this worldwide patent. And I think you touched on that in my intro, but I was then named as the lead inventor on that patent for this technology, which was um, looking at the depth of rolling contact fatigue cracking in rail. So I think that kind of gives you the weave really of, you know, I started in aerospace, moved into to rail, but really this common theme, which is all about assets, asset maintenance, asset management, and how you can really get the best out of digital and technology to really enhance how we do that. Wow, great answer. What a journey. You know what? I would like you to answer more on this because the flow you explained right from the university, leaving the college and uh, your journey till date is really amazing. And the way you explained makes me really glued into your area. Wow. Let's delve more into asset management. Now, please tell me how has the integration of digital technologies transformed traditional asset management practices in the railway industry and what challenges did you encounter during this transition at Porterbrook Rail Leasing? Yes, yeah, so I guess one thing to kind of set the scene on this question is Porterbrook Rail Leasing is only dealing in the UK. So I'm going to talk about some challenges here from my experience in mainly passenger rail in the UK. Um, and I'd be really interested actually at some point to kind of look at how that how that shifts as you move more globally. But I think it's fair to say that um, rail is still at the start of this kind of transformation of traditional asset management with digital. Huge strides have been made in the supply chain. And there's so many technologies available now that are ready for use in rail. So movement away from manual measurements um, of asset condition is now fairly commonplace. You know, there are quite a few people who are doing it. And um, there's lots of infrastructure and rolling stock digital systems in use to help asset managers make more informed decisions about what to do next with their assets. Um, I think there are still lots of challenges, though. Um, one of the ones that I had particularly when developing the crack detection product base was evolving standards. So it's quite a boring topic, really, but actually it's completely fundamental to any technology or supplier actually getting a pathway to, to business. What I found in the UK was that actually those standards um, almost mandated the use of manual techniques because that was all that was available when those standards were created. Um, I think one of the things that a big challenge in asset management and, and where more 
more focus and, and more um, more shift could be motivated is actually helping those standards be reformed at the same pace at which technology is made available. And maybe actually to give a bit of an example on that one, in the end, actually, we, we struggled to get the UK market to be first adopters of fact detection technology. And we actually had great success with Deutsche Bahn and um, Swiss, uh, Switzerland, um, SBB. So they, I managed to reshape their the standards on how they, they monitor and how they manage um, their rails uh, based on depth of cracking using technology instead of visual kind of measurements. That was a massive, massive achievement. I mean, I think it took about three years. And then slowly Network Rail kind of came on board with that. But, you know, if you think about that time frame in the scale of a small business, you know, that's enough to, to, to bankrupt a business. You know, they're investing in something yeah. that hasn't got a market path that's the kind of shorter than three years. That's a real challenge. I think the other thing really um, is looking at the kind of the complex interactions within rail as well. So, you know, back to your question on my experience at Porterbrook Leasing and this digital transformation. Well, another hurdle was these complex interactions between asset owners in rail. You know, if you look at that political landscape between owners, manufacturers, maintainers, operators, they're often really different organizations. They've got very different business drivers. So implementing these whole life systems, which essentially is what you know an asset management piece of technology is, is it's looking across whole asset life. But you've got buy-in that you, the, that's required across all of these different kind of political leaders and political landscapes is really challenging. You know, that the business case development is the thing that I, I spent a lot of time at Porterbrook focusing on. Who should pay for the tech and who's seeing the benefit? And often the person that's in the position to actually invest and implement the technology is not the person who's going to actually see the ultimate benefit. There's a thing there around how digital tech transformed to date, which is we are now doing much more kind of digital uh, and remote condition monitoring type approaches. We're using data to make better decisions, but there's still a way to go. There's the standards evolution and there's also how do you navigate the business case across this political landscape? Lots of work to be done in this space. Let's talk more about on developing transport products at PA. Uh, in your role as uh, head of digital services and now developing transport products at PA, how are you tackling the enduring adoption of digital solutions across suppliers, customers and within your organization culture to maximize the benefits of asset management strategies? Yeah, and I actually think this is one of the toughest topics, actually. Um, and just, I guess, again, for the benefit of your listeners, the reason that the kind of the word enduring adoption comes in there is that I've had a lot of experience of seeing kind of technology and approaches enter into the rail industry and then kind of die. You know, get put in a cupboard, doesn't get used. People just can't get behind it. And sometimes with, you know, huge upfront investment to get that thing mobilized. Um, so really looking at how do you get something to stick? You know, I think that is fundamental to anyone who's interested in the asset management space. Really important thing to understand that getting something to stick is not is not easy and, and shouldn't just be kind of assumed that it will just happen naturally. So at Porterbrook, um, and now actually within PA as well, my kind of belief on this topic is actually it's all about engagement between senior leadership and tactical delivery roles. So decisions to invest in technology-driven solutions are often decided by people who are really separate to the guys and girls who are actually going to implement them within that same organization. So if, if you look across the lifetime of an asset and how the technology is actually going to function and interface with operating teams, you know, that is critical. You, you've got to understand that at the outset. And it's also really important to consider how it might evolve because, you know, generally you're looking at asset life cycles, which are probably decades long. So, you know, don't assume that, that your starting point is going to be, you know, a fixed configuration for the rest of time. You know, you have to kind of have the foresight to consider how this might evolve and, and also different people that will be interfacing with that technology at different points in that asset's life. Um, so looking across that lifetime of the asset and technology and how it will interface with those teams, as I say, is, is really important. It's also important to consider kind of, you know, when is the job done? So I've seen several examples of technology deployment where people think the job is done once it gets released, you know, and, th and this is then this whole risk point of, well, actually, if it's not been adopted by those operational teams, um, it, it can just die and, and that investment can be can be wasted. So my view actually is when the technology is delivered, that's the start of the mission, not the end. Enduring adoption is much more likely when people are using those systems as their norm 
and that takes time you know and and they have to personally see that genuine value is being seen from these systems um it's it takes a lot of time particularly with complex systems and the other thing that's important about that journey is it's really unlikely to be 100% right first time especially if there's significant changes to business processes so you know that whole business process mapping is, is a really key part of this enduring adoption so mapping this journey ensuring all parties are committed and engaged until the end is really fundamental and the other thing is realistic expectation setting you know understanding that this is going to have its humps understanding that it's a team effort and this isn't just a kind of standard supplier customer relationship where you deliver something it should work out of the box i don't think asset condition monitoring is like that you know i've not seen really many examples where it's that simple Um, and without that understanding and that genuine commitment across all stakeholders to get it to be a success for the lifetime of that asset is really fundamental Um, and you know i think part of your question question is, you know, enduring adoption, but also making sure you maximize the benefits that those that asset management opportunity presents. Well, without that kind of full life engagement, what you see is maybe some benefit is gained, but actually that technology is not given the opportunity to really maximize the benefits. And sometimes people walk away disappointed, you know, and that doesn't help that whole culture around digital transformation and asset management because it gets a bad name, you know. So actually we have a responsibility if we're engage in these types of projects to try and make them successful and make sure people don't walk away disappointed at the end. Um, I guess I might kind of go on a little bit from that because there's, there's an interesting thing that I'm doing at PA at the moment, which is exactly on that theme. So um, we're working on a piece of kit that, that basically um, evaluates the cost across an asset's life cycle and we optimize it using linear optimization to get to the bu- bu- best financial outcome. Um, but this whole bit of embedding is the bit that I'm spending the absolute most time on. So the ironic thing about about this is the optimization piece is actually a very complex technology thing. Sounds really tough, right? Really difficult. Involves world leading technology. There's loads of specialists involved. But in my mind, that's only half the battle. So once we've got that plan, which was pretty difficult to create, how do I get people to change what they're doing on a daily basis? and actually make that plan a reality, you know, and that that topic is something that which I've been working on a lot at PA recently on this cross stakeholder engagement, you know, this plan of adoption. So I think, you know, my whole career, I've kind of seen that same theme. Um, I think I've got better at identifying kind of optimal pathways through it. It's also great to see, actually, you know, you get these various stakeholders that actually come together and you hear them voice their different wants and needs from this, this thing that you, you're saying you, you can offer. Um, I think the other thing that's kind of important when you're talking about asset management is there's often a very stark um, difference between the long-term strategic thinkers and the responsive tactical planners. And every asset needs both of those. So the solution has to take into consideration the kind of wants, desires, needs of both those parties and somehow get those to come together. And without that, um, I think enduring adoption kind of risks failing. So, yeah. Wow, what a great answer and great insights. Very interesting. I can see all your hard work and I really wish you all the best in what you're doing, Stephanie. And also to add... Can you share a specific example of a successful digital initiative in asset management that you have led and the measurable impact it had on improving operational efficiency or reducing costs within the rail sector? Yes, I think this is a great question because it's looking um, at kind of the reality of it, right? So, you know, there's lots of great discussion around what the art of the possible is in asset management and technology. But this is a nice one because it's, you know, what is the opportunity and what did it actually achieve? So the example I probably choose here is one that um, I worked on when I was at MRX Technologies. So that was the the mining railway company. Um, So actually, when I was at MRX, we we ultimately um, branched out into products that were considering passenger rolling stock and infrastructure as well as mining railways and I moved with that organization back home to the UK um, where I headed up the engineering teams in our UK office and at that point we were then looking at not just the kind of crack detection stuff that was my baby but also I was kind of heading up all of the other technologies we were covering so a lot of those were camera laser based system a lot of kind of computer vision type algorithms that we were working on Um, and a big um, product that we uh, delivered to the rail industry was in depot 
um, automatic inspection systems. And these are systems that you drive a train through and it measures a whole bunch of stuff on that train. So um, wheel profiles, brake pad thicknesses, brake disc thicknesses, graffiti detection, hot axle box detectors, a whole load of stuff. Um, and each of those systems individually had huge value to offer to depots. You know, there was a really strong business case to put that kit in there. And I would say, actually, I talk about it a bit retrospectively, but there's huge kind of movement in that space currently right now. Um, and I know those systems are still in use. But the one that I wanted to choose here was the brake pad measurement system. So it sounds quite trivial, sounds quite kind of benign. But actually, you know, having a system that could automatically inspect the, the thicknesses of brake pads and essentially work out how much life is left on those on those components was transformational. Up until th- those systems were installed, um, the inspections were manual. People would go there with, with a manual gauge to work out whether or not those brake pads still met the safety limit. So what we did with that was we installed a system that could automatically measure them. And, and we were measuring these things, you know, every few days. That's how frequently the trains would go through the system. Um, but the other thing that we were able to do with that is we were able to really look at the safety case. And, and this was a critical step, right? So, um, and I think a little bit touched on it earlier in the conversation around standard, because once you get to the position where you can measure really accurately, you know, really repeatably, um, you really understand how that asset's degrading, you can start to then look at the safety case to see whether or not it's too conservative. And that's actually what happened here with the brake pad system is we were actually able to enhance the scrappage limit of those brake pads um, to actually get 30% extra life out of those components because we were so confident that this technology was measuring repeatedly, reliably, frequently enough that there was no safety risk by actually saying these brake pads can go a bit thinner because we know we can catch them in time. So 30% reduction in material wastage, you know, so from an environmental perspective, sustainability perspective, brilliant. 30% reduction in material wastage as well, you know, from a cost perspective, brilliant. And these systems were were in place um, completely automated. So you actually have time released from the people who were going to be doing those manual measurements to actually work on something else. So, you know, that there was greater efficiencies gained in the depots through doing that. That's the kind of figure I put to that, which is 30%. But that was one element of an entire inspection inspection suite that we were deploying. So, you know, it's a significant change, I would say. Yeah, it is. Wow. Great technology, great innovation and uh, great insights. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Stephanie. Given your extensive experience, how do you see the role of data analytics and predictive maintenance evolving in the future of railway asset management? Yeah, so and the way that I'm taking this question is very much focusing on kind of the analytics and predictive element of what this technology of. Yeah, and you know, and I, I actually think this is probably one of the most exciting topics, and it's one where I personally hope we see a really high level of maturity emerge over the next decade. You know, I think this that's the kind of time frame where this should be really kind of at its strength. Um, so maintenance in rail is typically really heavily time based you know and that naturally leads to over maintenance of assets sometimes under maintaining as well you know there's a bit of a risk there but generally you've got some quite conservative limits that are put in place and there's a great kind of beat frequency time based maintenance regardless of how much that asset's being used so the step change that this technology that we've talked about in this podcast so far offers is actually the ability to quantitatively actually understand how assets are degrading over their whole life just not just right now um so that means you can start to finally tune a maintenance approach. So uh, at the moment, the time-based frequency probably is the same through the whole life. Whereas actually you might see that that those time frequencies need to get shorter, maybe towards the end, but actually could be much longer at the beginning. So getting this understanding from having that technology in place really help us understand and finally tune our maintenance approach to maximize the life we get out of these parts with ideally minimal effort from our, you know, from an interaction, from a intervention um, perspective. But also understand how to design them better. Um, and you know, back to my kind of the core heart of my education, also improve the materials we're using because we start to see you know where bits could actually do with something a bit more or a bit less than what they've currently got in some cases um, and not all cases but in some cases um we'll move to pure on condition maintenance you know and, and the, the brake pad example that i just gave then that that's a really great example of a shift to on almost on condition maintenance you know you only touch it when it's broken you only touch it when it needs something you're not over maintaining so you know once you move to that situation you're eliminating the risk of over maintaining you know that's kind of an ideal gold standard case but the 
The challenge here is that you have now shifted into dynamic maintenance, right? So dynamic scheduling, and it's not trivial to achieve that. You know, there's something beautiful about time-based maintenance because you can do a plan for years out and you know what everyone's doing and when they're doing it. If you now completely transform that into something that's very dynamic, is very condition-based, is kind of slightly more difficult to predict, that becomes a real challenge. And I think that's something that that people are only starting really to uncover and unpick now because your maintenance plans and your associated supply chains now need to be super agile. They have to be able to rapidly flex. So that's really where the predictive analytics then comes in. So you you can use the technology to kind of understand your condition right now and you can kind of trend how that's performed over time. But right now is not good enough for your supply chain because your supply chain can't perform that quickly. So the predictive bit then becomes fundamental to making sure everyone can get stuff ready in time to respond in the most optimal way. So I think sometimes people kind of, that they might not see that, that that link is really fundamental in that the predictive maintenance is the thing that enables you to move to one condition because it gives people foresight to respond. So I think modern assets now are manufactured very much with this ambition in mind. You know, rolling stock rolling out of the production line is sensorized most systems are connected you know the cloud connections in there so a lot of real-time kind of data gathering and analytics that's already in place and the whole thing there is about informing better maintenance decisions but I kind of see at the moment that we're still very rigid on that in that we we still need to conform back to a time-based plan and I think this shift over the next 10 years will be really harnessing predictive Um, analytics, predictive um, maintenance, so that we can gear the entire supply chain to move something which really is data-led decision-making and based on something that's kind of a continually evaluated insight. So you're not left as we are now with a maintenance plan that was put in place at the very beginning of that product's life. You know, you've got something that is evolving as that product is changing, is eroding, is degrading, is adapting to different environmental conditions. And that, again, is what that role of data analytics and predictive maintenance is all about. Wow, I 100% concur with you. Great answer, Stephanie. So moving forward in your role, so what role do you believe digital technologies play in the future of asset management, especially in the context of rail sector, but also considering your experience in aviation? Yeah, okay. And I think um, we already just touched a little bit on the potential of evolving kind of asset maintenance through data and analytics. Um, And it's a particular area of interest for me. But I think the real reach of this technology is wider. And I guess one of the things actually that I want to just define at this point is what I personally mean by digital technology and products. So for me, these span both the the physical and the virtual space. For example, um, physical sensors could be installed on asset in service and, and or you could have kind of novel ways of distributing power and comms across interconnected vehicles. But these technologies could also be cutting edge um, algorithms that are used to analyze and optimize real world plans. So there's kind of a blend here of digital and physical, even though we're kind of talking about digital tech. I just wanted to kind of confirm that we're also talking about physical sensorization and and, and physical interaction with, with assets. So with that in mind, I think the key aspect of this digital capability is the opportunity to connect and distribute insights from these systems. The key word here is connection. You know, and in many cases, that's real time if needed. But actually, a lot of the time, you don't need it in real time. And that's also important. I see quite a few specifications coming out, which are asking for real time data, which is quite an expensive thing to achieve and also quite complex, you know, from a supplier perspective. I would challenge people to make sure that they really do need it in real time. And if they don't, you know, what kind of lag can you cope with? Is this a once a day thing or is this, you know, with a 10 second lag or with a four minute lag? You know, those decisions actually make a massive difference to the design and the cost of something. Something. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Connecting, I think using digital to kind of connect these multiple stakeholders who are otherwise siloed from working together can really reveal untapped value and efficiency. And I, I think we're just at kind of of that. We're just scratching the surface of that at the moment. And it's completely like I'd say more relevant in the rail industry than anywhere else I've seen in transport so far, because we've got such a large set of stakeholders and organizations. You know, and I touched on this in one of the earlier questions. They've all got different drivers different planning horizons the thing that unites us is our common industry goal which is essentially mobility of goods and people 
right? So actually everyone's trying to do the same thing, but our businesses are kind of geared to reward us and, and respond better to slightly different motivators. I think the digital approach has a huge role to play really in this interconnection of stakeholders and the assets themselves. So starting to consider all aspects of assets in rail as this single connected system um, is something that digital technology and approaches will, you know, can really enable. And I think we almost need that to make that possible. I guess a really good high level example here would be connecting track and train. So in the UK, track and train are managed as totally separate entities, you know, which is slightly bonkers, right? Um, they're interlinked in their physical and commercial impact on each other. You know, I've actually spent a lot of time on tribology, you know, looking at the wheel rail interface, I was on some of the, the industry groups in that space. And actually, even at my time at MRX, I was, you know, really working with groups of real specialists across the industry where track and train came together to look at that wheel rail interface. Beautiful answer, Stephanie. I really love talking to you. We spoke so much about asset management, and I think this is my first episode on asset management. People would really take advantage of this episode. Can you, before I let you go, can you give me a advice uh, to rail professionals, not just me, to all the rail professionals, especially working in asset management? Yeah, I mean, I think I've, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I never really considered myself to be in asset management. And then I had this realization that actually, I think my whole career, has been focused on it. I think there are a couple of things. I think patience is an important um, quality in, in, in asset management and for people who are engaged in asset management. You know, I talked a lot about this journey of trying to introduce technology into asset management. It's going to take time and everything is probably kind of unique when it's introduced. So being able to actually spend the time to evolve and develop something is a fundamental skill of an asset manager. And I think people need to come in with that mindset. I think there's also kind of a curiosity um, to asset management. You know, uh, some of the, the, the barriers I've come against, the age old kind of statement of well we've always done it this way um you know and not being afraid to ask well why and is there a better way to do it and I think again that maybe leans into one thing which I've not really touched on yet in the podcast but the skills um transformation you know people have to get comfortable with digital and kind of technology that that's being introduced and it's not wrong to be afraid of it and it's not wrong to think that it's not going to work but equally you know from a leadership perspective you need leaders who are willing to take a bit of a risk leaders who are willing to kind of really give it a go and also be committed to kind of getting over those humps and hurdles to make it a success so I think there's a resilience you know resilience mindset there in asset managers to kind of know that the future is digital and technology and it's going to take you know some hard work to get there but actually, the opportunities are enormous. Wow, what a great advice. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for your time and coming on to this podcast and sharing your wisdom with us. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. I was really excited about it. So hopefully um, people gleaned some nuggets of usefulness from it. Thanks very much. They will. Thank you. I believe everyone listening to this podcast has got something to take away from today's discussion. If you like this podcast, please listen, follow and share this podcast within your network. If you believe we should be sharing your story or someone within your network, there is a railway leader who should be here sharing his or her contribution to this industry. Contact me on railwaytransportationsystems at gmail.com. Thank you for your time today. See you next fortnight. Until then, stay safe and take care of yourself.